Well, I'm back. It's been about six weeks that I've been away from the podcast now. I banked a bunch before I left on my vacation, my month-long vacation in August, which was amazing, but also kind of anxiety-provoking at the same time. And I want to talk about how that affected me, having a month off, because I've been working on this business, you know, becoming the Anxiety MD for like seven years now. And I haven't had a lot of rest. I've been banging my head against the wall for about five of those years I was no one really listened to me no no one paid much attention and then I put the book out in October of 2020 and then things started to change quite a bit so when things started to change it was like okay I am starting to get some traction now I am starting to get a bit of a following and I'm trying to create something that really changes how anxiety and not just anxiety all mental dysregulation is treated because I think we go from a very mind-based focused focus in this society. We're very focused on the mind and how great the mind is and how wonderful the mind is. But by the same token, the mind isn't going to heal you. In fact, the mind is the reason why you're anxious. Anxiety is basically a sense of overthinking and it's also overfeeling in the body. So the way I've told you, and those of you that listen to me quite frequently know this sequence, but it's we experience a trauma that's too much for us to bear as children. That gets pushed down out of our conscious mind into our unconscious mind so that it's not playing upon us every single day. And as the body is a representation of the unconscious mind, the body keeps the score, that energy of alarm that isn't resolved or metabolized as a child, gets pushed into your body. Now, that trauma can get resolved and metabolized if we have attuned, attentive caregivers that can look after our traumas, our bullying, our abandonments, our neglect when we're younger. But if we don't have those parents that look after us, or in my case, the parent was the cause of my trauma, not directly, my dad was never abusive or, or violent, but schizophrenia is a difficult thing to live with. When you see your father go completely off the rails, it's very difficult as a child to get some balance in that. And I think a lot of us as children had a parent that we couldn't rely on or was actually abusive to us. And in that, I think we start judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming ourselves, what I call jabs. So how it goes is we get a trauma that's too much to bear as a child, It gets pushed from the conscious to the unconscious, and as the body keeps the score, that trauma gets pushed out of the unconscious for long-term storage in the body. And it stays there. As what I write in my book, Anxiety Rx, it stays there as background alarm. And that background alarm is read by our brain constantly in this process called interoception, where the brain is reading the body. And if the brain reads trauma alarm in your body, It's not going to make up stories about cookies, picnics, and having a good time. It's going to make up stories of pain and suffering. And it's going to bring back the pain and suffering that you suffered as a child and the pain and suffering that you're currently undergoing now. So that's one thing about us anxious people is that when things go wrong, we exaggerate it. One of the things about anxiety that's horrible in human beings is that we underestimate our ability to handle problems, and we overestimate the size of those problems. So we underestimate our ability and we overestimate the threat. And the reason why that happens is that when we secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine in the brain, we go kind of unconscious. Cortisol, stress chemicals paralyze the prefrontal cortex. They paralyze the rational thinking part of our brain so that Not only do we make up more threats when we're in survival mode, we're in sympathetic overstimulation, fight or flight, paralyzes this prefrontal cortex. So we don't have the ability to see that our worries are actually kind of ridiculous a lot of times. Have you ever had a worry and it just freaked you out and then a day later you thought of that same worry and it didn't bother you at all or bothered you very slightly? The difference was the state of your body. That's the difference. If your body's in alarm, 
you shut off your prefrontal cortex. So you shut off the part of your brain that would rationally look at your fears and say, you know what, this is really nothing to worry about. There's also a structure in the brain called the hippocampus and the hippocampus is constantly making new cells. It's constantly learning about its environment, our environment, and it's really associated with the amygdala. They both sit in the temporal lobe of the brain. There's left amygdala, right amygdala, left hippocampus, right hippocampus. And the hippocampus kind of modifies the amygdala. The amygdala doesn't recognize context. So if there's a Halloween spider around and it's red and purple and you know that spiders aren't red and purple, there's part of your brain that kind of goes, yeah, that's just a fake spider. It's not a real spider. But your amygdala will still react to that fake spider as if it's a threat. So you may notice when you're looking at things that are caricatures of your fears that they seem more real. So this hippocampus is basically what tells us, hey, this context, in this context, and walking through this haunted house, I'm actually safe. This isn't actually really what's happening. But the amygdala, when something jumps out at you in a haunted house, will freak you out. And I notice that most of us with anxiety don't like scary movies. We don't like going to things like haunted houses because we kind of live in this exaggerated version of fight or flight most of the time. So why, why would we want to go into a place where that just makes it worse? So again, going back, first thing happens is we get traumatized as children. For me, it was watching my dad go schizophrenic, watching him go psychotic. And then I couldn't handle that consciously, so I stuffed it into my unconscious, and then I stuffed it into my body, and, and it sits in my solar plexus. If you read my book, that's, that's where it is. My, my alarm is in my solar plexus. And my alarm has kind of been going off quite a bit lately, even though I had a month off in August, because I've been working on this sort of anxiety MD business now for about seven years. And I never really took a break. And last month or the month of August, I took a break. And surprisingly, it wasn't as restful as I wanted it to be. For the first three weeks, I was still stuck in that hypervigilance. As many of us anxiety people are, we have this sense that if we keep busy, if we keep our minds busy, we will avoid our pain. Which is true because what happens is if you go up into your head, you move away from that alarm sensation in your body. Now, when things quieted down for me over August, I didn't have all these things to do with Instagram and podcasts and all that kind of thing. That alarm came up and I had nothing to kind of assuage that alarm because what I used to use was overwork and making Instagram posts and you know, writing chapters for books and stuff like that. So I was really faced with my own alarm again. And it was really odd because I haven't really felt a ton of anxiety for the last couple of years. I'd have moments, of course, and I still have the odd panic attack, which I actually enjoy now, which is, <laughs> which is weird. I'll go off on a bit of a tangent there for a second. I enjoy panic attacks now because I know they're not real. And I enjoy the rush in my body. I, I actually appreciate how my body can get so fired up so quickly. And I'll tell you how I deal with panic attacks. And there's a YouTube video about this if you want a longer version. But basically, when I start feeling it, because we know, we, we panic attack people know what a panic attack feels like when it's building up. We know, and then we go, no, 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 I can't, I can't feel this. I can't, no, 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 no. And the more you push against it, it's like pushing back a tidal wave. Like you can push it back for a little bit but then it just explodes all over you. So what I do, excuse my language coming up, but when I feel my panic coming up, I will say to myself, okay, I'm going to make this the best fucking panic attack I've ever had. You want, you want me? You want, you want a piece of me? Like Elaine from Seinfeld, you know, you want a piece of me? And it's like, I say, okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's make this the best panic attack I've ever had. Now, what that does is it puts you in control in a way, or at least gives you the illusion of control. Because when you take control of your fears, you start secreting, you know, your, your brain's natural morphine, your brain's natural painkiller from the periaqueductal gray in your brainstem. When you face your fear, your brain secretes morphine that helps you go through that. It also secretes more dopamine, which says, hey, you're on the right track attacking your fear. When you go after your fear, instead of going back on your heels, you're on the right track. Because what happens typically is we become victims. As soon as you become a victim, 
you go back on your heels, you're afraid of what, what you're afraid of, your body starts creating cortisol instead of morphine. So instead of anesthetizing to the pain that's coming up, which your brain will help you do if you actually attack or lean into your fear, you lean back and you pull away from your fear, in which case you start secreting a lot of epinephrine, adrenaline, and cortisol, which of course reinforces to your brain, hey, we're in real trouble here, even when you're not, even when this has just been a thought process that you've created in your own mind. So understanding that when you take control of a panic attack and you say, I'm going to make this the best damn panic attack I've ever had, you're in control. Your brain starts secreting chemicals that will support you instead of creating chemicals that will make the panic attack worse. Okay, that was an aside. So going back to the original premise, you get a trauma in your childhood that's too much for you to bear. It gets stuffed down from your conscious into your unconscious, and then from the unconscious, it goes into your body and stored there as what I call background alarm. And it's, it's always in there. And there's this process called interoception where your brain is always reading your body. So if your, your body reads this alarm in your system, it creates worries in your mind. Your mind is a make sense, meaning making machine. So when it reads this alarm in your system, it creates stories of terrible things are, that are going to happen in the future or it reminds you of things that have happened in the past, maybe consciously, maybe not. So you go into this state where you lose your prefrontal cortex because these chemicals paralyze the, the rational part of your brain and activate your emotional brain. Now the, you know, the whole thinking brain, emotional brain, you know, body brain has kind of been debunked. But in this context, I think it's really helpful to understand that you have a thinking brain. And when your body is calm, your thinking brain works actually quite well. You look at your worries and you go, yeah, maybe, but that's unlikely it's going to happen. Now, if you move away from your fears or your alarm starts coming up, it shuts off that part of your brain that says, hey, this is really nothing to worry about. And of course, you start feeling panicked or you start feeling anxious. And then you create more worries because your mind is a make sense, meaning making machine. And then you believe those worries, and when you believe those worries, the original background alarm that's sitting in your body from your old childhood trauma gets aggravated and increases in size and intensity as well. So that creates more anxious thoughts, which creates more alarm in your body, and you get into the alarm anxiety cycle, which I've talked about before. So to heal from this, this is my thing. We have to go back and find that child. We go, go back and show that child that they're seen, heard, loved, and protected. Now, that's kind of hard to do because we've been spending most of our lives, sometimes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years even, trying to avoid that child's pain. The child that's in us, the inner child, the younger self, whatever term you want to use, it's in us. And much of our lives, we've spent moving away from that pain. And in a way, when we move away from the pain, we move away from the child and the child freaks out. You know, if the child felt abandoned as a child... That sounds funny, but if, if the child feels abandoned to start with and you as an adult, adult you starts abandoning child you, how do you think that's going to go? Not well, not well. So you're going to get more alarm. That child, the alarm in your body is basically the child in you, the younger version of yourself that was hurt, wounded, scared, alarmed, afraid, abused, abandoned, bullied, neglected, that still lives there, still lives inside of you. So the only way of healing that is to go back, find that child, show them they're seen, heard, loved, and protected in a way now that they weren't back then. And we can do this. Like, we can heal from this. Now, the word of caution around this is if you had severe trauma, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, you can't do this alone. But it's, it's, it's wonderful to know that this is the cause of your anxiety. Your anxiety actually isn't in your mind. Your mind just creates anxious thoughts because of this alarm that it reads in your system through this process called interoception. So when we read this alarm in our system, our mind consciously, actually that's wrong, our mind unconsciously makes up these worries. And we believe the worries because we freaking made them up. You, you know, you make your own horror stories based on your own past, you're going to believe it. You're going to believe that if you were bullied, that you're going to get bullied again. 
you're going to get you're going to believe that if you get called to your boss's office that you're going to get fired like this is just normal natural like anxiety 101 stuff when you're alarmed your brain not only makes more threat by worries or whatever but also paralyzes the part of your brain that would say hey these worries aren't really real so you get double whammyed in there so how do you, how do you heal well, again, you heal by connecting with that younger version of you. And how do you do that? Well, I'm going to talk about this in the, in the podcast coming up and really drill down and show you processes. But basically, it's finding the alarm in your system. Think of what caused you a trauma as a child. Try not to pick the worst trauma of your life, but what, what hurt you as a child? And then really see if you can close your eyes and go into that feeling and go into that situation for me, it was just watching my dad sometimes be taken away to the mental hospital, sometimes visiting him in the mental hospital. That was very distressing for me is seeing all these other mentally suffering people and seeing that my dad was right in there. In fact, probably one of the worst cases in a lot of times. And then where do you feel that in your body? Like take your own trauma. And for me, if I close my eyes and I remember going up to, you know, 3A or 3B at the Eric Martin Institute in Victoria, where my dad used to get hospitalized. I can still smell it. I can smell what it smells like. And it creates this alarm in me that I feel in my solar plexus. And it's sharp, and it's hot, and it's purple. It's about the size of my fist. It pushes up into my heart. It pushes back into my spine. And that's my alarm. That's little Rusty. That's the younger version of me. So I put my hand over that area, and I would advise you to do the same thing if you can find your alarm. Put your hand over that area and see if you can breathe into it. And maybe make some slow, soft circles with your hand over that area of alarm. And then just make the mental intention of connecting with the younger version of you. You know, find their eyes. Can you see... And it's amazing how often people can actually see the younger version of them, see their eyes, actually see what they're wearing, see the front door of their house that they lived in or their room. The more deeply you can get into this feeling of, you know, what was it like to be bullied? What was it like when your father was drunk? What was it like when your mother was screaming at you? Like, can you feel that in your body? And where is it? Some people, it's in their throat. You know, if that's the case, put your hand over your throat. Breathe into it. How you heal from anxiety is that you find that younger version of you and you see them, hear them, love them, and protect them. Now, in a way that they didn't feel back then. That's how you heal. You can do all the CBT and all the EMDR and all that kind of stuff you want to do, but until you actually go back and find that younger version of you. And having a picture of your younger self is helpful too. I often tell people, put that up in your bathroom mirror. Connect with your younger self as often as you can. And not just when you're in pain, not just when you're feeling anxious. So many people, it's like, well, I've got a, Dr. Kennedy says I have to connect with my, my child, my inner child when I'm feeling anxious. Well, you do. But it's also really, really helpful to connect with that child when you are feeling good, when you're doing something you love doing because that child doesn't know that you become successful or that you have good things in your life. They also don't know that they're not that helpless, powerless child anymore because that's the thing about the amygdala. The amygdala has no sense of time, so it records our traumas but also will take us back to that age when we feel anxious or traumatized. So when we get really alarmed, I turn into a 10-year-old. I don't look like a 10-year-old, but I, but I feel like it. And I understand that, okay, I've regressed into a 10-year-old. How can I show that 10-year-old that they are actually safe? And also my point is, can you bring your child, your younger self, into the good things in your life? And acknowledge really that that child holds the best part of you. As much as you judge, abandon, blame, and shame that child, that child holds your best traits and characteristics. 
the generosity for me, the sense of humor, all that stuff comes from him. So we get trained when we're younger to reject that younger version of us because they hold our pain. And as we get older, we kind of separate from them more and more. And anxiety at its root is a mind-body separation, which is why things like yoga and tai chi and all that kind of thing help with anxiety. They bring your mind and your body back together with physical movement. It's also a separation of your adult self and your child self. So when the adult and the child are separated, it creates more alarm and doesn't allow that alarm to heal. So typically alarm gets worse and worse and worse as you get older. And I believe that alarm is that child in you asking to be seen, heard, and loved now in a way that they didn't get back then. So this is the first, the first podcast back. So my mind may be a little fractured. So I hope I, I maintain some sense of order through this. But really to heal, it's really about connecting with that younger version of you. That's, that's how we heal. You can cope. You can do all sorts of psychotherapy and CBT, and, I, and I'm not against any of these things. But unless you ground yourself somatically, unless you find that younger version of you in your body, see them, hear them, love them, and protect them, which is what you know MBRX is designed to do, my mind-body prescription for permanent anxiety healing. That's what it's meant to do. And that's why I priced it at $100. It's less than a, a therapist visit. Because I want everybody to have access to this information. Anxiety Rx is a wonderful book. Like people love that book. I get messages every day saying this is the first time someone has explained my anxiety in a way that really makes sense to me, that I really feel. So, but the Anxiety Rx is a bit of a it's a it's a it's a long book. It has a lot of stuff in there about inability to receive and how your ego prevents you from healing. And each episode of this, I, I want to give you a little piece so that you can kind of take this away. And this piece is, and it's probably the most important piece, is to find that younger version of you. Now again, if you had you know, massive physical, emotional, sexual abuse, you're going to need some help. You can't do this on your own. But for most of us, we can start feeling like we have some agency in our anxiety when we start really feeling that younger version of us. For me, it comes up first thing in the morning. He comes up, he comes to me first thing in the morning, just about every morning. And I just put my hand over that solar plexus and I just say, look, I'm here for you. What do you need? And often it's not even verbal. It's an emotional feeling like, I am here to give you whatever you need. I know that you're hurting. I know that I can help you. I want to help you. I want to connect with you. I'm not going to abandon you. That's a huge one. It's because that child felt abandoned. We didn't get the love and attention that we needed when we were younger to metabolize the traumas when they happened. So we have to go back and in a way relive those traumas, but with our adult self shepherding our younger self, knowing that we're not helpless children anymore. We're actually adults with a tremendous amount of agency, at least so much more agency we had when we were a helpless, powerless child. And the trauma was happening to us. So it's really developing that relationship with yourself. Again, anxiety is a separation of your mind and your body. You go into your head to avoid the alarm that's in your body. And the byproduct of that is your adult self separates from your child self. So how we heal from anxiety, and this is what I really want to get out into the world, is not so much changing your thinking. It's changing your feeling. Anxiety is a feeling. It's actually the feeling of alarm. Anxiety is just your brain's explanation of the alarm that's in your body. I'll say that again. Anxiety is just the explanation of the alarm that's in your body. So you can't heal by fixing an explanation. You have to heal by healing the source, which is finding that child, finding the alarm in your body, which are one and the same, and then showing that child that they're seen, heard, loved, and protected. Now, this takes practice. And again, do it when you're feeling alarmed and do it when you're feeling good. When you have a nice event in your life, bring the child, bring the younger version of you. Hey, look at what we're feeling. Look at what we're experiencing. When you're out on a nature walk, bring the child with you. Look up, look up and feel connected to that child that's in you because that is how you heal. That's how you heal. All this other stuff helps you cope. 
But to heal anxiety, to really heal it, you need to become whole within yourself. You need to connect your mind and your body and your adult self with your child self. That is what I'm going to dedicate the podcast to. I'm probably going to start having more guests on as well. I'm hoping to get Kyle Cease on fairly soon. That's in the works. So we'll hopefully, because I love his work and it really aligns a lot with, with what I talk about. So I'm hoping to get him on the podcast within the next month. And thanks for listening. I really want to be the voice of healing for you in a sea of maybe practitioners and counselors that don't really understand what anxiety is. I lived with it for 40 years. It almost killed me. I know it pretty well. And I also know how to dismantle it. And I want to show you how to do exactly that. So thanks for joining me this week. And I will see you next week.